right, everyone. Again, we have a packed session today, so we're going to go ahead and get started. It's so great to see all of you in the chat. Um, so we're going to go ahead and start off with some introductions. For those of you who aren't familiar, DonorBox provides an affordable, easy to use, and powerful online fundraising solution that enables quick and easy fundraising for you while you build meaningful connections with your supporters. From our attractive embeddable donation forms to our robust donor relationship management capabilities built to empower meaningful connections between you and your donors, DonorBox works with and for you as you establish, scale, and sustain your nonprofit, meeting your needs at each stage. So you can learn more about DonorBox at DonorBox.org. And we have some special guests today. Memory Fox is a technology platform built specifically for nonprofits to collect, organize, and share impactful stories from their community. Memory Fox is a veteran-owned organization located in Buffalo, New York. Go Bills, they say. But they have an incredible team located across the entire country, and they believe that every nonprofit has great stories to tell. We agree with this. And they relish the opportunity to help bring missions to life through video, photo, and written testimonials. So you can learn more about Memory Fox at memoryfox.io. All right, now to the good stuff. Today, we are diving into a question that's been on the minds of many this time of year. Do stories raise more year-end funds? And I will let you in on a little secret. The answer is a resounding yes. I don't think we're surprised here, right? But hey, we are not here just to talk at you today. We're here to have a conversation with you. So we will be answering your burning questions as we go along in this content. So make sure you have your questions queued up if you didn't submit them ahead of time so that we can get to them. So we're looking forward to an interactive session. Now, before we dive in, let me introduce you to the folks on this panel who will be guiding you through this journey today. So please welcome Carly Euler, Marketing Manager at Memory Fox, Natalie Monroe, Community Engagement Manager at Memory Fox, Kara Augsburger, Fundraising Coach at DonorBox, Kara Schmidt, Content Marketing Manager at DonorBox, and yours truly, I am Jenna Lynch, the Nonprofit Advocate here at DonorBox. And together, I'd like to say that we are definitely a panel of very passionate individuals who eat, sleep, and breathe fundraising and storytelling. So we're really excited to be here with you today. And yes, by the way, this session is being recorded and all those who registered will receive the link to the recording this week via email. So go ahead and look forward to that. And we will also be sure to link some of these helpful resources as well. And here's what we've got on the lineup today. We've got a packed session um, with some great pro tips and questions and answers along the way. All right, let's go ahead and kick things off. Kara, I'm going to pass it over to you. Hey there. You know, I think we're all logged on because we have one thing on our minds right now, and that is year-end fundraising. And this is a tough season for fundraising, and donors have fewer dollars to give. And it seems like more nonprofits are kind of feeling the pinch right now, and more organizations are asking your donors for support. So getting ready for the year-end can seem like a big task, but it's so important. So let's look at some reasons why it's so important. So more than a third of overall giving for the year happens at year end. Right now through December 31st, you're going to realize a lot of your annual income. And for many of those organizations, you know, sometimes they raise half of their income in those last couple of months. And I was at a board meeting a few weeks ago. We talked about our year end fundraising plan. And for reference, we pulled out the income sheet from last year and saw that exactly half the revenue for the year came in November and December. So that's why it really is a big deal. People are often very charitable this time of year for a few reasons. But um, we also know that there's some research that says 74% of adults plan to make a charitable contribution this holiday season. And we also know that of those 74 adults, 
they'll plan to donate to two or three charities during this year end giving season. And there are some ways that your organization can really be in their top two to three when they think of making their year end gift for sure. And I'll give you a, a, a hit. A lot of it relies around the stories you tell of the impact that your organization is doing. So here is a little poll for you. You can just put this right in the chat. There's some emojis available to you in the chat. How are you feeling right now about your year end giving strategy? Are you feeling really, really confident? Maybe celebratory? Yeah, I think it's okay. I'll give it a thumbs up. Hmm, I'm not sure. I'm uncertain or not very confident at all. Use that chat. Okay. I'm seeing a lot of like, no, not great. Maybe some uncertainty, not very confident. And a few of you are like, yeah, I think I, I think I got this. Well, that's really good to know. Thank you so much for sharing that. You know, sometimes we struggle with not knowing where to begin. And maybe that's how you're feeling right now. That's kind of what I'm picking up from the chat here. And so the solution is to really focus on developing a clear, compelling message and then repurpose that core message through different channels of communication and deliver it consistently over the time of a campaign. I work with some of our donor box clients to really iron out a clear core message and then adapt it into fundraising appeals that can be delivered through a mailbox or in an email inbox or through social media. And what really drives home that message are stories of impact. And so I think a common mistake this time of year is just expecting a social media post on Giving Tuesday or just sharing a donation page link to be magical and bring in those big dollars. But in reality, a successful fundraising campaign involves focused planning. It involves some strategy. It involves some time to really think through what you want to say and make it compelling and really illustrate the impact that you're making in this world. So it's not about that post or just link sharing. It's about preparing in advance to ensure your message is good and it reaches the right people to convey why your cause matters and how they can step in and support you. And I'll end with this, but you know, you might be thinking, uh oh, like we've already missed like some early planning, but I just want to say, don't worry. It is not too late to start. The key is to take action now, even if you might be a little bit behind. The sooner you start, the more you can accomplish and the better chances you have of meeting or even exceeding still your year end fundraising goals. And our team has some really good ideas in store for you. Thank you for that, Kara, for setting up the scene here. Now, like Kara said, it is not too late to start. And a good place to start is with engaging your donors. Of course, you should be doing this all throughout the year. Um, so not just your end, but the, if you haven't started yet, let's go ahead and start now. So um, here are some ways that you can make sure that your organization can be in your potential donors top two or three choices, as Kara said, when they think of making that year end ask. And a lot of this is going to apply to your storytelling for year end as well. So as always, you want to personalize your outreach when you're speaking to your supporters, your potential donors. So imagine, this is how I say it, imagine you're writing a letter to a friend. That's the vibe that you want, right? So when you personalize your messages, it's not just here's what we're doing, here are the cool things that we've accomplished. It's like saying, hey, we know you, we appreciate you, and we are grateful for your support, and this is what we can do with your support. See, the theme here is you, not we, right? And when donors feel that personal connection, they're more likely to open their hearts and their wallets, right, during this year-end giving season. And then, of course, my second tip here is to express gratitude and recognition. So it's not just about saying thanks after they donate, right? It's about spreading that love all year long. So express your gratitude really genuinely and often. Share those stories of impact. Show the tangible difference that their support is making. And remind them that they're not just donors. They're really partners and catalysts for fulfilling your mission, right? And then now that your end is definitely coming into full swing, this will really, really pay off. And they're just gonna be excited to contribute, right? 
And finally, pro tip number three here is to use multiple touch points in your communications. So creating different ways to reach out to folks really builds that trust and connection because you're meeting them where they are. So picture it again, like building a friendship. Our donors are our friends. If you only see your friend once a year, it might be hard to maintain that strong bond, right? Especially if you don't ever hear from them. But if you meet up, you text, you call, you share stories throughout the year, you, your connection, it deepens. So similarly, creating those multiple touch points with your donors shows them that you really value their relationship, what they have to say, and their contributions. And um, again, this just meets them where they are, and it really helps foster that genuine interest in your cause. So just a few tips for your end here. Now, I want to pause for a moment and give you the floor. Do you have any questions about your end donor engagement that we can answer right now before we move on to our segment about storytelling? Well, I do see a question that came in earlier, and maybe we can answer it here. Um, what's the best timeline to roll out a year end campaign? Uh, I know that my Kara's may have a good response for this, so perhaps we can answer that. Oh, you know, we have one from Michael. So let's see. In the dog rescue industry, it seems that most stories focus on more sad elements. Would it be better to focus on happier stories? We're going to answer this as well. We have a specific slide for it. I will. I can tackle the timeline, the timing of a year end campaign. Um, and I see Florence asked a question in here as well. But um, I like to start a year end giving campaign in November and end it on December 31st. If you leave things open ended, that's not really a compelling or urgent time frame for your supporters. A good campaign has a beginning and an end. A lot of organizations will use Giving Tuesday as a kickoff to their year end fundraising campaign and take those communications, a very similar messaging through through the end of December 31st. So that's my recommendation. And Florence asks, she says, most people don't read anymore. How can we send a brief request? You want to tackle this now, Jenna, or a little later? I think that this will likely be answered okay. very shortly we'll as well. Florence. So Florence, hang tight. Um, and I think um, our folks from Memory Fox have some really great questions here. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Kara with a K to bring us into our storytelling segment. Thanks, Jenna. So now you know a little bit why you need to fundraise at year end, and we've kind of covered how to reach out to and engage your donors with those multiple touch points, that personalization, that gratitude. But how do you really make sure that your donors are both engaged with your mission and make that critical year end gift? So, well, it's important to remember one key thing. Uh, and this is my this is always my top tip with story storytelling. People give to people or or animals or real places. Uh, people give to people. People don't give to organizations as much as you like to think that you're the hero of the story. And trust, trust me, you guys are all our heroes. Um, it's really the donor who is the hero here and also the pe and they want to give to the people that you're serving, not to you. Donors don't really care about you hitting your year end goal so that you raise more money than you did last year, right? Even though that might be your goal, they don't really care about that. They want that emotional connection and to see the real impact their dollars have on those that you serve. And the best way to form this emotional connection, you guessed it, through storytelling. So I'm going to hand it over to Carly, and she's going to dive further into why storytelling is essential to the success of your year-end fundraising campaigns. Okay, yeah, thanks for setting us up so wonderfully so we can talk about all the things that we love about storytelling. Um, yeah, from a general standpoint, <laughs> we have um, three great stats here to share with you that I hope really inspire you to embrace storytelling even more than you already do. Um, but first, right off the bat, let's just be honest here, storytelling, you're going to remember a story 22 more, you're more likely to remember a story 22 times than just a stat alone. And I think this 
always comes off as a little, like a really big difference, right? Everyone's always like, oh, how can that be possible? And uh, Jenna and I actually talked about this um, recently, but if you think about it this way, this is really why you can remember, like if you go to your childhood hometown where you grew up, you probably still remember how to drive to your best friend's house. And that's because you remember the story of how to get there. It's you go to the stoplight at the end of the road and you take a right. You drive past the fire hydrant on the left. You drive past the hardware store that's one block up and then you take a left and you're at your best friend's house. You might not remember even the name of the road that they live on or the house number, but you're gonna probably remember that story. So that's um, just one way of thinking about how sticky stories really are for you. And then also, we find that 92% of consumers want ads to feel more like a story. So yes, it doesn't always sound the best to be like, oh, my nonprofit, we're like advertising to people. But guess what? You do have to advertise to people. I mean, that's part of marketing, right? You're just showing people about your mission and you're telling people about what you do. Um, and what I'll say about this point is, when you are maybe looking for a new place to go out to eat, maybe you're looking for a new restaurant or something, sure, you go to the website, you get all the information, um, maybe to check out a new restaurant, but what's the next thing we do? We go to a reviews website and we read other people's experiences and see, hey, what were their experiences like? Did they enjoy it? And if they did, then maybe I will too. That's just you learning other people's stories and their personal experiences from what they've done in their everyday life because they're just like you. So um, that's just kind of a way that you can make or that you can feel more involved with a brand because you're going to know the story behind the brand as told by other people. And then finally, this is a brand new stat that I just recently found and I thought it was so interesting, but 65% of all of our human interactions consist of storytelling. So, I mean, that's what we do in everyday life, right? So why would we not want to put it into our strategy for your year-end giving or really into your strategy for everything at your nonprofit? Um, and I'll go ahead and show you some pro tips as well if you want to go to the next slide. Oh, but first let's do our poll. I would love to know how important it currently is to you at your nonprofit that you build a story bank um, of community testimonials. and it's okay if that's maybe important to you, but you're not quite doing it yet. We're just interested in like, how do you see the value in it and how important is it to you at the moment? And we got a scale of one to five here. Okay, it looks like we have, okay. A lot of people are saying this is very important to them. A lot of fives on the board, 34 fives. Okay, that's huge. Well, I'm glad to hear that you guys all are finding or are no, under understanding the value of storytelling at least or at least can see how it could bring value to your organization. And let's tell you how to do it. So these are kind of just, it was really hard to pick three, I have to be honest, but here are the three pro tips that Natalie and I agreed upon that come with just the overall collective storytelling. So number one, creating a culture of storytelling at your organization is so, so important. And what I mean by that is having stories available to you all year round that you can use when it comes to end of year giving is so important, not only just for the ease of being able to put together your campaigns, but for your stress levels. Cause I know you guys all have so many things to do. You don't have enough time already to do what you want to do. Um, so a lot of times we can get to the end of the year and we can say, Hey, you know what? I've got all these great impact numbers, but let me find a story that really helps to tell that to uh, prove those impact numbers. And then you're like, okay, where did I save that one photo or that one video I got and who was in it and what was the caption? Okay, where was it located? Do I have consent to use this? And then all of a sudden, um, you know, this is now a stressful thing and it really doesn't have to be when you, when you try to um, make it so your organization is a culture of storytelling where you're collecting all year round and really putting it towards the forefront and thinking more forward about collecting your stories. So that's my number one tip. And then number two, we love to talk about this, but capturing stories in real time. Um, again, this is kind of a silly analogy, but when you watch the Oscars, when you watch the an award show, why do they always have the cameras on all the nominees when they announce the winner? 
because we want to see what their real-time reaction is going to be when they win or when they find out they didn't win, right? And that's like, that's not something you can recreate. People, that is a real-time reaction. That's really what we're interested in seeing. That's what your donors, what your supporters are interested in seeing. And that's what's going to get um, them to give you a real-time reaction, which hopefully is donating to your organization. So similarly, for like a nonprofit perspective, Natalie and I like to joke, if you are the Arbor Day Foundation, for example, and you plant trees, well, it's probably kind of a silly thing to do to just unplant the tree, to replant the tree, to get you to get some video content of you planting the tree. But if you are thinking more forward, thinking about collecting stories and you are capturing a video of planting that tree in real time, that's when you're going to get the real emotion, the real sweat dripping off the, the person's face who's digging the hole. And that's what's going to really inspire people to be connected to your mission. And then finally, this is kind of an out of the box pro tip, but we challenge you to consider multiple perspectives. So most nonprofits, and we would agree that uh, think that program participant stories, so the people benefiting from your nonprofit, those are the most important stories. We agree, those are super key. However, I challenge you to think, what are the other stories that we have around us that are also interesting to tell? Maybe it's someone in your accounting department explaining what was the toughest financial decision you all have had to make and how do we not have to make that decision again? Or maybe it's why is your board member coming? Why did your board member join your organization? What is the story behind that? I mean, you have your volunteers, you have other staff members, you have donor stories. These all have meaningful connections to your organization. They all have their own emotions associated with them. And they also have a lot of institutional knowledge that people just want to hear. So that's my third pro tip for you. Those are some excellent pro tips. And I know we have some questions about storytelling waiting for us in our questions tab here. So again, the floor is yours. We're going to answer just a couple uh, before we move on to talking about video. So let's see here. I saw a couple of questions is, um, how can I reach the world with my stories? And my response always here is, crowdfunding. Um, of course, once you create that beautiful video or story, crowdfunding is an amazing shareable way to get your message out there and really helps you uh, cast a wider net and make sure that it's easily um, accessible and shareable to everyone. So I would definitely look into crowdfunding to sharing your stories. Now, um, this question from Florence, we didn't quite get to yet. So most people don't read anymore is the feeling that we're having, right? So how can we send a brief request, but still kind of create that, that story that resonates with people without boring them with uh, too much content? This is such a good point. Um, I can start off here if you'd like. Okay. Um, okay. I would say that, okay. Well, I would say, so there used to always be what the term above the fold, right? So you would always want to make sure that the most important thing or the message you're really trying to get across was above the fold. And that was talking about a newspaper, but now we're talking a lot about computers and how people are seeing it on their screens. So now the term is above the scroll and that's what we need to be getting your message out um, shorter. So people will want to read it because even though people don't think or people don't read as much anymore, they still can read because we know that 80% of people watch videos with the captions on. So that means people actually do really like to read. We just have to put it in a way that they're willing to read it. Um, that was the first thing that came to my head. Does anybody else have anything to add? Sure, I have something to add. So um, I was actually gonna mention the above the fold or above the scroll, um, especially uh, still above the fold in those mailed, mailed uh, appeals. But another great way to make sure that your story is coming across is I always say to write for the skimmers. So that means use your bold, use underlining, pick out those key pieces of the story, of the letter, of the email, whatever you're writing that moves them through so that if someone's just skimming it real quick, they're going to get the most important points they're going to get. So what I do is I when I write it, I just read those bold points by themselves. And if it makes sense altogether, you're good to go. And we also say too, another great thing with especially mailed appeals is to put in a PS and have that just be um, a summary, a, a one to two line, basically summary of your story, your call to action. So that again, if those people are just opening your letter and reading that last sentence, 
that last PS, they're going to know exactly what your story was and exactly what you want them to do. Excellent advice there. Thank you. Now there's one more question that I really want to get to in this segment, and I see a lot more coming in. This question from Michael, I think is so great. How important is it that the content that we share is super polished, right? Uh, is there a benefit to more amateur um, appearing content? And I want to jump in and say, there's a difference between amateur and just simple and authentic, right? People really just appreciate authenticity. Yes, there can be beautiful templates and email designs and highly curated productions that are very captivating. But some of the most favorite stories that I consume are just selfie cell phone videos of uh, executive directors that are like, hey, Jenna, what's up? Thank you so much for this. It feels very cool and personal. And I think right now, um, I mean, in general, people just really appreciate being authentic. You don't have to have a crazy polished product, in my opinion, um, to really showcase what your values are, what your organization's values are, and really connect with your supporters. Yeah, we actually completely agree with you. Cool. We actually always recommend to our customers, don't even bother editing out those ums and those ahs, because that's actually what you sound like, and that's your real way that you speak, and now you sound like a human. I think sometimes when we are looking for something so professional, we actually lose a lot of the human aspect of the story, and that's exactly the opposite of what we want to do. So, and and yes, I do agree with you that amateur doesn't necessarily mean um, like it won't be successful or something. It it's it definitely has proven to be more successful, especially when you're looking at you know all short form videos. I know we're going to get into that though, so I'll I'll hold back on that. And I'll also I'll also okay. add that authenticity is really really important right now. We live in a world of AI. We live in a world of um, so much marketing coming to us all the time that when you send something authentic from just your smartphone or from your inbox to theirs even, that is really, really proving successful for a lot of organizations. Yeah, Kara, I just want to piggyback exactly on what you just said that the, the best thing about authenticity and the way that it builds such a great community is because authenticity builds trust. Transparency builds trust. And ultimately, trust in our nonprofit world is the currency of everything we do. We know if donors don't trust us, they're not going to give our dollar, their dollars to us. So using authentic content, real, raw, like Carly said, um, allowing people to share in their own voice in a way that's very real and authentic and raw and not overly produced, not overly edited. Um, that's what's really going to resonate with your communities, with donors, with everybody in your ecosystem to build that trust and then ultimately um, allow people to see the great work that you're doing and stewarding through trust as that central basis. And I'll just um, add on kind of touching on that, like how to create these things that aren't overly produced and sort of touching on Florence's uh, question earlier. One of my favorite examples of um, the delivery of content is uh, an organization that I get a weekly email from. They're called Roots Ethiopia. And every Friday they send a Friday photo email. And it's just a super simple photo with maybe a couple lines caption but the fo photo is very vivid compelling a lot of great imagery around the people that they serve and maybe a short description of what they're doing and it's so easy for me to consume just every friday this really happy nugget lands in my inbox it takes me 30 seconds to look at it but it kind of leaves me with a very joyous feeling for the rest of the day so um, i think keeping it simple and doing it in a, in a very authentic way is going to be the basis for what we want to do to steward our community Thank you all. And I think that is a perfect segue. And I promise I'm seeing all of your questions coming in and we are marking them to answer. That is the perfect segue though into the role of video in modern storytelling. So Natalie, I'm gonna go ahead and pass it back yeah, to you. Yeah, well, wonderful segue. Thank you, Jenna. Um, <clears throat> video, you know, I, I keep coming back to, before I touch on video, I keep coming back to these two stats that I'm hearing paired and in tandem with each other. And that is, we know that 97% of donors cite the impact of their gift as a major decision factor in them giving funds to a nonprofit. That's huge. But even more than that, when I heard the stat last year that 80% of donors are not told what their money did, that was kind of appalling to me. And it made me think, no wonder why we have such a 
um, such difficulty with donor retention in our sector is because people are giving their money and they're not hearing those impact stories of what they did. And so we're really losing out on the opportunity to connect with people. And what better way than to authentically lift the voices through our community and video shares to come back and show um, the impact of their dollars. So I want to get into why video is so important in storytelling. And I'm going to start with um, some of these stats here. But before I get into that, I don't think anybody um, would debate the importance of video, especially as we move forward in time, especially as evidenced by how TikTok has taken the world by storm, how we know reels to be um, so popular these days. And we have this saying on our Memory Fox team that video is not the future, it is the now. That's not to say that it's too late. Now is the time to get involved with the video moment to start figuring out how video can work with you. Um, and as that ties to fundraising, I'm going to touch on some of these stats that we've laid out here. And if you listen to the great podcast episode that Jenna and Carly did together, you likely heard um, Carly reference this first stat. And that is that 114 uh, percent more funds are raised when a campaign includes a video with that. Now, I just want all of you to let that number sink in for a moment. That is a huge, overwhelming statistic. And I just want all of us to think about if we're not using video tied to our fundraising campaigns, what potential for fundraising are we losing out on by not including it? This is, of course, not to say, um, as we've sort of touched on already, that video doesn't have to be hard. It doesn't have to be these long, overly produced pieces. Um, I will touch on that next uh, on, the, on the following slide. But really, short snippets, short reels, Real short impact stories directly by your community are not only the most powerful form to be able to share with your donors, but you're also going to uplift your community by hearing authentically through their own voice what they have to share. 62% of users, oh, sorry, Jenna, I'm, I'm going to let you go back. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so, okay, so 62% of users said they're more interested in a brand after seeing it in short form video. To me, this totally makes sense. I think. I think of all the brands that I am most personally attracted to, and it does feel more personally engaging when I understand them more than just words on a page. When I've seen some sort of visual representation of their brand or their organization um, shared, and not to mention, this is how people consume content these days. Which then leads me to this third stat here, which is Gen Z. We cannot ignore this youngest generation ready to engage with philanthropic causes that are up and coming, ready to start investing their money in causes important to them. And we know Gen Z engages with videos very regularly. Heck, they practically create videos in their sleep. It's so like natural to them um, to both consume it, but also to communicate through video. Think of things like Snapchat. Um, and so what is really fascinating to me is that data has shown that for Gen Z, two of their top three values are authenticity and transparency. So again, coming back to that very genuine connection, videos and content that for them are going to offer a real glimpse into the lives of staff and beneficiary. So how can you find ways to build those meaningful relationships based on trust? Um, and a lot of that is through this video. And this great stat here says that 79% of Gen Z find out about causes through social media itself. And of course, the primary media for that social media content is video. So I'm going to let you now advance. Thank you, Jenna. And um, just want to put this question out here. Maybe some of you are doing this already. Maybe some of you want to get started and just aren't sure how. And that might be why you're here today. But I am curious to know. Um, when we talk about impact videos, how many of you are incorporating that already into your storytelling efforts and how frequently? And okay, we got a good distribution coming in here. Uh, we got a good amount of weeklies. That's excellent. Love to hear that. Um, monthly, annually, and never. And again, there, there is no judgment here. This is all why we're here to learn. It's just helpful to kind of have that understanding of where everybody is in their journey and thinking about ways that we can strategize around incorporating that into your work going forward to really connect your donors to your cause. So excellent. Thank you everybody for chiming in. Okay, so we've got the high level stats. We all can understand now why video can be so engaging and compelling. 
But that doesn't mean that it, it doesn't still feel daunting and challenging for us as nonprofit professionals to try to incorporate it into the work that we do. We're busy. We wear so many hats. How do we possibly take time out of our day to collect videos from our community? And I'm going to give you um, three pro tips here that we've narrowed it down to to help this feel a little less overwhelming for you. And the first one I want to touch on is using clear and concise CTAs. And by CTA, I mean calls to action. So what you're actually prompting your community with, the um, question or the leading that you're giving them to have them hop on film, hop on camera and answer your question. And so we have found in our work with customers that having something super specific, super simple and easy is the key to getting your community to engage with you, to participate and to send you videos. So this could be something as simple as fill in this statement. This mission is important to me because dot, 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 and let them share in their own words why. Or the most important thing I learned from engaging in this volunteer work is or maybe you're reaching out to your program participants and asking them to share why, how pro participating in that program impacted their family, or what did participating in our program teach you? Um, there's lots of ways that you can tap into show, to showing the work that you do represented in that video form. Maybe it's at the event itself, like Carly said, maybe you're capturing the person, like digging the hole, planting the tree, doing the work in action. But maybe it's not the work in action. Maybe you're having somebody a week later reflect back on how that event made them feel or that working with your organization helped them overcome a challenge because. So I think um, really key to all this is starting your community with the prompt and letting them fill in the rest. Then number two, prioritizing authenticity. We've touched on this a ton already, so I'm going to keep this short. But again, the best way to allow your community to share through their own voice is giving them a very authentic way to do it. Um, you know, we all have these devices. Your phones are super powerful. They create really great video. This doesn't need to be something big and produced. And like Carly said, encourage them to just share in their own words and not make it something that's overly edited. If they put in the ums and the ahs, that's what makes them human. That's authentic, that's real, that's relatable, that's how we all speak. And again, I'll share that authenticity is what builds trust in your community. Um, and ultimately, yes, we wanna show the impact of our, of our work with donors, but we also wanna elevate those voices in our community. That's the whole reason we exist. These, this is your chance to give those people that you work with the opportunity to be seen and heard. And then finally, keeping it short, um, let your community know it's okay to share in 10 to 20 seconds. That's a really great starting point. Honestly, people don't want to take three minutes to share a video. The consumer also doesn't want to spend three minutes watching the video. So making it a very low barrier to participation, you're going to see more people coming in to share. You're also going to get a better um, impact piece on the end. And I think like rather than asking somebody to share in three minutes the hardest time that they've ever had in their life, instead say in 10 seconds, can you share why your journey um, and your, your journey to transformation has made you better? These are all wonderful pro tips. And I know we have got some more questions waiting for us. So I'm going to go ahead and head over to our questions tab here um, to answer a couple. I know we have um some really good ones so someone had already asked and i think everybody in the chat answered video can be expensive how can we make sure it's worth the investment well it doesn't have to be a simple cell phone video it's what we'd really recommend again doesn't have to be highly produced and um you know what it's even better if it isn't so it doesn't have to be a big investment it's just worth a little bit of time right now let's see we have some more coming in and we may have already answered it in the chat um Someone had asked, and Kara, this may be for you, when do we start this year-end storytelling? When do we start posting these videos and sending out the emails and um, engaging folks for year-end? So now is a great time. Now is a really great time. Fundraising is more than asking. It's about attracting donors to your cause. And video and these stories are a really great way to make your organization attractive to new supporters. So use... Um, Tell a story now that might be like the prequel to your year-end fundraising campaign. Show some impact, show 
your mission in action so that when it is time to ask, your donors are nice and warmed up and ready to just raise their hand and support you this year end. So now. Thank you. Now. Now, Emma asks, Facebook algorithms share uh, videos over two minutes or more. So how do they balance that out? Uh, most of their organization donors are older and only on Facebook. How do we make sure that the algorithm is favoring those kind of shorter videos? Yeah, I can pop in here because I was actually just chatting back to Emma in the chat screen there. So um, there is, I just want to say that, yes, when you think about like short snippets are good, but how do you, how do you get something that's a little bit of a longer piece? There is real power in numbers. So maybe you pose like one of those prompts that I suggested earlier to your community and you ask five people to share a 20 or a 30 second clip and singularly, maybe that 10 second clip isn't going to make a super huge impact, but if you can weave five, eight, 10 of them together into one video reel that's longer, that fulfills that two minute mm -hmm. threshold, um, that's gonna end up being really powerful to hear so many different people in, in your community answering that prompt through their own voice and what participating meant to them. It kind of reminds me of those, has anybody seen those stand up to cancer signs that people hold up at like um, major league baseball games and they say who they're standing up to cancer in honor of or in memory of. And it's really powerful to take in when it's a whole crowd of people holding up one sign, it just has one single name written on the sign. But when you take that all in as a grouping, that really makes a statement. So I would suggest um, trying to, and to Carly's point, you want to collect multiple perspectives and multiple voices. So tapping into different um, groupings of your community and making one longer piece out of their short snippets. Wonderful. And one more I'd like to tackle here, um, and we'll move on and look at the rest of them and some that we're highlighting on our slides today as well. This is a great one. So how do you store these stories? Once you're collecting them, how do you store them? Do you put them in a folder? Do you save them in a server? Uh, Memory Fox, you are up. <laughs> sure, I will take this from here. I'll start. Um, the number one thing I would say when it comes to storing your content, we do provide this through Memory Fox, but you obviously can do it DIY as well. Put it in cloud storage, put it on your Google Drive, put it in a in something that is going to not only be on your computer and not only accessible to yourself because not saying you might you might be at your organization forever, you might be at your organization for another couple of months and you still want those stories to live on beyond your tenure at your organization. That's super important to be like to let your whole organization in on the story. So putting it in cloud storage. And then also I would say um, there's a lot of different ways that you could organize it, but probably the primary way that's going to keep you the most organized would be having it by date or by event and really being specific about what those dates are, especially what year those pictures or those videos were taken. Um, and then somehow linking it to the consent forms as well. So you're super aware when you want to go back and use that content, you actually have the ability and the, con the consent to use that content as well. Um, I hope that answers your question. Excellent. And one more follow up. Um, can Memory Fox also store static photos or selfies? Absolutely. Yeah. So, our system, we have videos, photos, written testimonials, and you can also do bulk uploads. So, if you're somebody who takes a bunch of pictures on your phone at an event, maybe while you're getting ready for a gala, maybe while you're enjoying your time at your gala, um, you can bulk upload those later. Uh, that's how it works. Wonderful. Now, all we're going to go ahead and move on to answer some of the most popular questions that we're seeing in the chat that we got in registration. And then we're going to come back to the questions that are coming in here as well. So I want to start with something that we saw probably in the top three questions as people were, were registering. Um, so how do your end stories differ from other stories an organization tells? And I think, Kara, with a K, you've got um, something for this. Sure. So um, for my experience uh, working with nonprofits is I usually suggest saving that biggest, the most impactful story for year end, because this is when your most of your donors are probably going to see this story. Um, you really wanted to make a huge impact on them. Um, but also, just like with any campaign, you should choose a, a theme, um, whether that's, you know, planting trees or um, some some program, a part of your program. If you're serving children, maybe you have a camp 
and a therapy center. Pick one of those two um, as your theme. And base your stories you shared during the campaign around that theme. So throughout, and then um, to expand on that, throughout the year, you might share those quick stories we're talking about, those quick videos. Um, keep sharing them on social blog. I know we had a, a question about this a little bit ago. I recommend when not just starting now, but continuing throughout the year. Storytelling shouldn't just be at year end um, because your, your donors are going to know your story better. If you start now and continue throughout all next year, they're going to know your story better. But again, do those quick stories throughout the year and save that big, that whopper of a story. I usually start thinking for the next year, you know, January, when I started going out and capturing stories, start thinking, which one am I going to save? Which one's going to be that big, big year end push? Um, just to have to have it that year end. And I'll just add that while the, as Kara said, the, the theme or the focus of your story might change, the structure of your story doesn't really change at year end versus what you're doing throughout the year. So you still want it to follow that same structure of engaging the audience. You want the stories to be authentic as we've touched on and you wanna unlock empathy. Empathy is ultimately what leads to philanthropy. So making sure you have that rising action in your story, ending it with a magnetic call to action. So you're not just falling short after making this really emotional, compelling story and then having a very cold donate button at the end of that. Um, still like creating that, that uh, eliciting that emotion from the donor is important. So um, that in terms of structure, I don't think changes between year end and the rest of the year. Wonderful, thank you. Now, a next run, and we saw this quite a bit as well, our organization doesn't directly affect people's lives per se. So how can we translate our mission into a captivating story? Anything to add here to my wonderful panel? I okay, well, you know what? I'll, um, I couldn't I'll, unmute I'll, myself fast enough. I know. <laughs> No, we're, you know, yeah. take, take it away. So I think um, even though your mission isn't, and I, I believe this one was tied to um, somebody who does forestry work, but even though your, your mission might, might not directly benefit people or animals, people are still always going to be core to your work. So I think the key is to telling telling your storyline in the perspective of the people who represent your mission. So maybe you're asking your donor why they contribute to their mission, or maybe you're asking a volunteer to share why this work is meaningful to them and why, in they, why they choose to engage and be involved. Um, maybe they share the work that they're doing to protect the environment by joining this movement and talking about the implications of certainly there are humanistic implications because of that environmental work. So finding that storyline through human voices is still going to be very compelling despite who your mission is serving. Um, and I think there's always ways that you can find to highlight those humans who then shed light on the importance of your mission. Excellent. You took the words right out of my mouth and um, re-emphasizing there that you really want to paint that vivid picture of the positive change possible with those humans, those people's support. So uh, focusing around that um, really helps. Okay. How can we strike a balance between preserving um, anonymity, wow, anonymity, there we go, and still crafting a compelling and relatable story for our audience. We had several people saying we work uh, with folks um, in several sensitive areas, whether it be um, shelters or addressing mental illness or addiction, where they don't want to exploit the folks that they're serving, right? This is a huge, huge question and uh, something that is very important. So I'm going to um, pass it over. I think Kara with the K, you had some thoughts around that as well. Sure. So um, I've definitely also been in this position um, working for uh, the volunteering for a nonprofit uh, that served addiction, things like that. You can still um, share those stories, still make sure you're getting permission, of course. Um, you can still share stories without using names, with changing names, or without, you know, using other identifying information. Um, those can still be powerful. Um, and in the case of images or videos, you can still get creative with like stock imagery. You know, the the hand, hands are always a really popular stock image. Um, and for videos, um, what we kind of just touched on is you can still get a staff member or a volunteer who is personally involved with that story um, to share their perspective on it. 
um, again, without that identifying information. And I think Carly had a few tips on this as well. Sorry to call you out. <laughs> no, I, I would be happy to expand on this. So I agree with everything you said. Those are all really wonderful suggestions. Again, just as Jenna said, we get this question all the time. So thank you for asking it and know that you are not alone. A lot of people are struggling with this. And I really respect that you asked this question because I think we are growing as a sector in the way that people used to be maybe okay with or more okay with asking tough questions, even if it meant that they were going to re-traumatize the person by retelling their story. And I love that we're all trying to be more cognizant of this. Um, so first I will just say, just a little quick plug, we are doing a webinar about this exact topic in December because we do get this question a lot. So that is just one quick thing. Um, but I would also say that um, Kara's exactly right. There's a lot of other ways that you could still share stories. The perspectives of the program, of the people running the programs, um, their perspective of how they are helping people and how those, it, how um, the mission is impacting several people, even if it's not about one person. Um, we also see a lot of times if somebody is willing to write down their story, you could have someone else tell their story. And th that means they wouldn't be in the video and that would be fine, but maybe it's just some B-roll, even if it's a B-roll of a beautiful uh, sunset or something like that. You see those a lot on TikTok actually with a little bit of overlay of what the actual story is. Those actually still perform really, really well um, in terms of getting out to new people. So that is so just a recommendation you could try. Yeah, and I I don't know why I'm, I don't know why I just disappeared here. Can I don't think you guys can see me. I'm seeing a black no, screen. No, we see you. I see you. Oh, you do. <laughs> I don't see myself anyway. Okay, well, I'm you're looking very you. pretty. I promise you look very pretty. I I just wanted to supplement what Carly said with a really um, great example that I recently heard that I thought was a very respectful but also still compelling way to show. Um, programmatic work while still uh, it, with people, it, I think it was foster kids that this organization was work, working with. And so they needed to keep their images off screen. They couldn't actually show the faces of these kids. And so they tried to keep those people confident or they respected keeping those people confidential, but they still wanted to have video to show the work they were doing. So they run this program where they have these foster kids engage in um, an art project. And so what they did is they very creatively filmed uh, a, video footage of these kids hands doing this art project and that was a really powerful way for people to still see the impact of what this was uh, of, like what their programs look like um, but totally preserving the anonymity anonymity of the faces that's tough work <laughs> That's a great tip too for anybody that's feeling camera shy. We saw some folks in the chat were like, I just don't really like being in the spotlight. I'm not comfortable being on camera. You don't have to be to tell a story. Um, all these can apply um, in that case as well. Awesome. We are plugging along and I know we're getting close to time. So I'm gonna pick and choose a couple more that we have on the screen and then double check through our chat to make sure that we're answering all of your pressing questions um, and we'll do our best to answer them in the chat box as well. I saw this come up. It's a great question. Do progress or happy stories perform better than sad or continued need stories? And um, Carly or Natalie, I think you are our gals for that. Sure, I'll kick it off. I would just say that, again, great question. We tend to like to come at things always from a positive perspective. So for us, um, we love to see a progress story. We love to see when the person who uh, is the beneficiary is ultimately the one who, you know, has the progress. We love to see that. And um, I think that those do tend to perform better. I know if I know, hopefully maybe a lot of people, maybe a lot of you are like me and I get very sad when I read sad stories. I mean, we've all seen the Sarah McLaughlin dog commercials from the SBCA. Those are very, very sad, but I have to tell you, I changed the channel at this point. It's way too sad for me. But if you did show me a dog that got rescued, I love those videos and when they're very happy about getting rescued. So that's just me personally. Um, but I would say that great, every great story is told with some element of emotion and that doesn't have to be sad. So sometimes we do just have to think, again, outside of the box a little bit because some other emotions that are really compelling can just be hope or excitement or happiness or relief. And what I mean by that is capturing a family, uh, like the elation of a family who has just moved into a home 
and they know they're debt free, that is really exciting to see. And that's going to really inspire people. Or when you see the hope in a student's eyes when their schooling has been paid for, or they get to attend their dream school, something like that. Like those are really wonderful stories um, that really show the progress or the happiness. And then one other small thing that we always love to plug at Memory Fox, uh, we would like to shout out our founder probably when I say this, but he actually always likes to say that we loved that people can start thinking more about Springsteen stories versus Star Wars stories. You don't need to have something so insane happen. And so, um, you know, the, the empire, the potential empire falling down, right? It doesn't need to be that big, but it could be a Springsteen story where, hey, this kid at theater camp, usually last year, they were too scared to get on stage. And this year they sang their heart out. I mean, what a, what a great little Springsteen story that would be. Um, Natalie, I bet you have something I missed there probably. The the only thing I'll add is on that note of progress that it's, um, there's, I think a distinction of like Carly just said, look at how we were able to support this kid and how happy he was singing his heart out on stage. That is a great impact story to report back after a campaign has been run and dollars have been donated. Come full circle and show the donor what you did with their funding. But in an appeal, when you're asking for money, it's really important the story is open-ended. You want to portray the story of somebody who is still in need of support. Um, you can maybe tell a story of somebody who's already benefited, but then share that there's another person like this who is in need of help. Because if a donor hears that this person has already been helped, they're not going to feel compelled or a need to give money because their journey has already come full circle. So making that progress still open so that you're compelling somebody to give. Thank you both. Now, how many times a month can we email everyone or post on social media or give them a call, whatever it may be? How many touch points can we have with the folks in our database and not feel like we are just bothering them? Kara, with the C, I know you've got- I love this about. question. You know, it really depends what you're saying. So I mentioned earlier, fundraising is more than asking. So if you are ask, 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 you might have some donor fatigue there. But if you're making your organization attractive, you know, you're sending that video that we just talked about or sending a little bit of um, inspirational copy right now, and then you ask them for support, and then you follow up by saying thank you, and then you show some impact of how that contribution made a difference, they'll be more likely to open those emails. So just make sure that you're really balancing out what it is that you're communicating. Also, my biggest pet peeve is when I support an organization and they don't take me out of future appeals for that campaign. And so it really feels like they didn't see my donation, that I'm not as valuable. And so as supporters give to you, make sure that you take them out of your asks and put them into some sort of gratitude campaign. You can write similar copy, but express gratitude in it instead of an appeal. So that's my encouragement. So specifically, how many times a month can we email everyone? Like Natalie mentioned, if you're sending a great photo with some compelling image, you can send that every week. Um, so really, it just really depends on your effort. I like to do three, and Kara will, can chime in on this. We both kind of agreed on this. We like to, a year-end fundraising campaign, an ideal one in our mind is one mailing with three follow-up email appeals spaced out between Giving Tuesday and December 31st. And then also sprinkling in some social media, kind of telling that story through different social media posts as well. Yes, I, I agree. And I would just um, chime in also to say that throughout the year, it's a good idea to, you want to make sure you're staying in inboxes as well. Um, there's a whole bunch of stats from different industries. Um, I typically see you do not want to be in inboxes any less than once a month. And even that might be too little. So also keep those multiple touch points in mind. Um, you don't want to be emailing someone every day, but as Kara was saying, as long as it's different messages um, and at the same time, you still want to stay in front of them. So keep that. It's, it's a nice balance. Yeah. Think of your email communication as a conversation, an ongoing conversation, and not just speaking at them and barking at them. You're continuing to tell stories. Thank you all. Now, I know we are at the top of the hour and we do have so many questions to answer that went by so fast. But what I can promise you is that we have got a goodie bag 
that may answer some of these questions for you. Uh, so Carly and Natalie supplied us with a wonderful Memory Fox goodie bag. Uh, Carly or Natalie, do you want to tell folks a little bit about what they're getting and how they can start at the beginning if they're just beginning? Definitely. We encourage everyone to start storytelling when, uh, you know, today, if you can, we would love for you to leave today with actionable items. And that's why we put together this goodie bag for you. So there is a worksheet in there that's going to help you create your first video campaign, get your thoughts in order, like a brainstorm style. There also is going to be um, 10 tips for taking a great video or to tell great video stories. So those are kind of how to take a great selfie video. Lots of great tips there. Um, we do have templates that we built in Canva that so that's a great way to share your story. Those have to do with the 12 months of the year. So you can pick whichever one fits your uh, your uh, feeling the best or whatever you're doing. So the, obviously there's the end of year ones in there. Um, we have our upcoming events. I already did mention that panel. So I'm glad to see some of you already signed up. Um, we have great interview questions, which really goes on that point that Natalie made about having really clear, concise CTAs. And then we obviously, hopefully you are all feeling a little bit compelled to, to learn a little bit more about Memory Fox and we would love to offer you 10% back if you um, become a Memory Fox customer. So that's all in the goodie bag, enjoy. Wow, you got the goods. Now we have also got a free download for you as well. I'm gonna go ahead and launch that. So this is uh, an ebook to Giving Tuesday appeals. So you can see an example of an email and social media appeal and how to make each of those appeals work for you with um, a comprehensive look at those research backed methods to help your appeals drive more donations. So let me launch that. Now you're gonna see that in the handout section of your tab and that'll be a nice tidy PDF for you. And as you're doing that all, I want to make sure that you stay in touch with us. There is so much to do, so much to learn at your end. And we are always so happy to hear from you, see you. You can reach out to DonorBox at support at DonorBox.org. Our team is amazing and they can make sure that they have the right person to answer the question for you. And of course, you can reach out to Memory Fox at Carly's email, Carly at MemoryFox.io. And we are on all of the social media platforms, type in DonorBox, type in Memory Fox, follow along. We are offering tips all day long, great resources. I know that Memory Fox has a million great events going on as well. So all the good stuff to help you keep learning. And uh, Carly, what is the handle for TikTok for you? Oh, our TikTok handle is Carly underscore MemFox. So I'm always doing fundraising tips and other fun stuff on there. Love it. And you can find us just typing in DonorBox. And all, I want to thank you for finding time out of your busy week, out of your busy year end to spend a little bit of time with us. We are so thankful for all that you do to serve others, to make the world a better place. And we all are so proud to offer the tools that you need to do so. So thank you again. And thank you to our panel today. Uh, we hope to see you home, uh, soon and happy fundraising and storytelling, everyone.